Happy Easter, everybody. Try to open that without spilling it everywhere. I didn't think about that beforehand. Oh, Resurrection Sunday. Glad we can celebrate together. This is uh, such a great time of year, the newness of life, um, the arrival of spring, the warm weather is sort of on its way, they tell me. And baseball is back. How great is that? So I got a little choked up preparing for um, this talk today because I went back through some of my older messages, um, talking a little bit about the priesthood. And so I went back uh, to some of my older messages here at Polaris, and I found one in 2010 where I talked about the priesthood of the Old Testament as it pointed the way to Jesus. And uh, started to read that message a little bit, and, and uh, I, I talked about back in 2010 the transition my oldest son was making from training wheels big boy bike. And, um, you know, now uh, both of my boys have made that transition, uh, and now they're both driving. And my oldest, who was then going into training wheels, is now off to college. Talk about um, life without training wheels. So training wheels are actually the perfect analogy for the Old Testament uh, and for the things that, uh, for the priesthood in the Old Testament of the Bible. When we put training wheels on our kids' bikes, we do it so that they can safely transition to freedom. We don't want them to think that uh, training wheels uh, are the best out there. We don't want to them to think that that's the way it's supposed to be. We don't want them to think that they're permanent. They're meant to cast a vision and to uh, help them arrive safely at the kind of freedom on the sidewalks we envision for them. We explain that training wheels are temporary and then we loosen the training wheels over time so that they have to kind of find their own balance. You know how important that is if you've ever helped a kid ride their bike and go from training wheels to, to um, no training wheels. And, and then we encourage them, right? And, uh, and then we threaten them. Like, if you don't make this switch, I will throw this bike out. And then we manipulate them by saying things like, training wheels are for little Steelers fans. until we get them done with training wheels. But, so if you ever help liberate a child from training wheels, you know how fulfilling it is to watch them the first time, the first few times uh, that they get to ride on their own. You see the pride and the excitement in their eyes. You, you see the freedom that they're experiencing. And so when it comes to the Old Testament, there are some things in the Old Testament that function very similar. It's the perfect picture of what happened in the spiritual world with the resurrection of Jesus. We were liberated by our risen Savior. There were many religious concepts leading up to Jesus that were restrictive, but meant to get us ready for the freedom that Jesus came to bring. We're invited by God to throw off the training wheels with Jesus and enjoy genuine friendship. So the book of Hebrews was this New Testament book, meaning that it was written to help us understand the ministry and life of Jesus. The Old Testament was about uh, hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus and had a lot of things pointing to the coming of Jesus, meant to get us ready for that. The New Testament helps explain what Jesus came to fulfill. And this is especially true in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament Testament pointed to how Jesus and life with Jesus is better, so much better than a lot of the things in the Old Testament. So this is from Hebrews chapter 10. The author says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. This is life before Jesus. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, 
had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, his death on the cross. He sat down at the right hand of God, so he was raised to life again, raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven to sit with God. Then verse 14 says, For by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who were being made holy. So he fulfilled priesthood through one sacrifice. Now this passage points to a few important Old Testament concepts that Jesus fulfilled, and they help us understand the meaning of the resurrection today. You could see them as training wheels, these concepts for ancient people, uh, and they were given these training wheels to get them ready for the freedom that the resurrection came to bring them. So I want to tell you about the priesthood, the temple, and the veil or curtain real quick this morning. (laughs) First, the author mentions priests. Religious life before Jesus was filled with priests. They were everywhere. It was their responsibility to represent God to people and to go to God for people. They represented God to people, and they went to God for people. They were the ones who declared whether a person was right with God or not. They chose who was in and who was out. They enforced the rules, and in some cases, the priests created rules. They talked to God for people. They approached God for people. But something better was coming with Jesus. That was all just to get them ready for the kind of freedom everybody would one day have with Jesus. The training wheels of the priesthood was that there was a buffer between people and God. There was a feeling that a common person could not approach God. All just training wheels. Only the priests could approach God, really. That was all just a setup to prepare people for life and friendship with Jesus. These training wheels were coming off when Jesus arrived. That was the priesthood. The second piece of symbolism that the, uh, that's implied in the book of Hebrews that we just read is the temple. The temple was in the middle of Jerusalem. So there was the, the city of God, essentially, and the temple was in the middle of Jerusalem. It was seen as God's house. It was the center of life in Jesus' day and long before Jesus, all the way up to his day. You went to the temple to offer sacrifices. You went to the temple to get yourself right with God. You went to the temple to worship. You had to go again and again and again to the temple in Jerusalem to make yourself right with God through the priesthood or you were kicked out of religious society. And religious society was the only society back then. Through their temple, they learned that God was with them, that God is with us. And there are some pretty steep boundaries in the temple. The temple was set up with lots of boundaries based on your faith and your uh, uh, gender and your lineage. That determined uh, what the boundaries were and how close you could get to the temple. The temple emphasized the presence of God on earth, but also the separation that our sinfulness caused. Now, This separation, which is an important word as it relates to the resurrection, this separation was best symbolized through a giant veil or curtain that hung in the temple. (coughs) There was this, uh, this room inside the temple called the holy place, okay? It represented life with God, kind of. And then there was a space within that room called the most holy place, and this giant curtain hung. And on the one side of the curtain was the presence of the living God. That's how they treated it. And then on the other side was separation from that thick presence of God. 
And the separation was so real that only one man, the high priest, and at that maybe once or twice a year, would dare breach the curtain, the veil, to enter into the presence of God. And the fear was that when that priest pulled the veil and walked into the presence of God, they tied a rope around him. So he died on the other side of the veil. My, do I need that? Okay. Is it cutting in and out? Cutting in and out. Let's try that again. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a major holiday if something didn't go wrong with my mic. It's kind of a tradition here. Um, so the priest would pull back the veil and enter the presence of God with a rope tied around him so that if he died, they could drag him out so that no one else would have to risk their life by crossing the veil. See the fear caused by the veil, the fear caused by that separation from God, that was in the temple, and that was the veil. This was the system. This was life back then. Naturally, this created quite a bit of power within the priesthood, which then led to quite a bit of corruption. See, when you get to decide who's in and who's out, when you are responsible for cleansing people in the sight of God, it gives you quite a bit of power. It gives you a leg up in society when you get to decide, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. Come to me if you want to be in. By the time Jesus arrives, there is a powerful political system that has been created that thrives on people being separated from God. The priests need the veil. The religious elite need the curtain. They rely on separation. If people start thinking God is now out of the temple forgiving people apart from them, they lose their power. If people start thinking that they can approach God on their own whenever they want, wherever they are, the religious elite lose their clout. The religious elite need to keep God in the box, behind the curtain. They need the veil. Jesus has a very different agenda, and his words are backed by his miraculous power. Uh, this is, this is uh, one of the most important messages of the gospel, is Jesus announcing that God is on the loose now, and then backing it up with his miracles. See, that's the thing. Anybody can say anything. But when it's backed up by miracles, now the religious elite have a problem. So there's this powerful verse in John's gospel about this dynamic that was at work through Jesus' ministry. In John 4.21, Jesus makes a statement that is somewhat lost in a modern audience. Okay, He says this, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now let me tell you what that means. That proclamation would have been every bit as scandalous as a political candidate running on a platform of ripping up the Constitution. Like, if I'm elected, we'll rip up the Constitution and start over. That's what Jesus, that's the, that's the implication here, because uh, he's, he's, he's talking with uh, people in a place called Samaria. They had a sacred mountain that was their place of worship because they couldn't get to Jerusalem. They weren't allowed to approach the temple. Everyone knew that the real place of worship was the temple. That's where you had to go to be right with God. 
So for Jesus to announce a time is coming when you will not have to go to Jerusalem to worship, and you will not have to go to the mountain to worship. You can worship God wherever you are because that kind of worship that God wants comes from the heart. That was a provocative, scandalous proclamation from Jesus. Jesus was announcing the collapse of the Jewish political system as they knew it. If you can worship God away from the sacred mountain or away from Jerusalem, if you can approach God from anywhere, the priests would lose their power. The religious elite would lose their power, and they didn't like that. Statements like these are what led to Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was crucified because he threatened the power structure of the ancient world, of the ancient religious world. He threatened to create a new system where God lived on the other side of the veil and outside of the temple altogether. They needed the veil. He threatened the religious elite by a worldview where anyone could be friends with God through faith. Not through the priestly confirmation process. No more fear. So they had him killed. The evil empire thought that they had extinguished the threat. But look what happened. What do you think God was telling us? Mark 15 gives us the details of Jesus' corrupt um, trial and crucifixion. He also tells us about the moment of Jesus' death. Three, or f three of the four Gospels mention this detail. It says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. They managed to kill the Savior who came to tear down the system and bring people close to God. But God found a way to show the system that he was winning anyway. I would have loved to have seen God himself tear down a curtain and think about what that meant to the power structure of that day, but he wasn't done. Luke 24 says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they arrived, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothing that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remember the words. It wasn't enough for God to just win the battle for symbolism. God had to win the battle entirely. The resurrection proved that Jesus had accomplished what he had promised. God had left the building. The veil had lost its power. And so had the oppressive religious system of the day. Now friendship with Jesus was for anyone, anywhere. The training wheels were off the bike. Two quick verses to make sure everyone knows exactly what Jesus accomplished through the crucifixion and the resurrection. First, I'm going to read Colossians 1, because now two things happen every major Jesus holiday at Polaris. One, my mic goes out. And two, I read Colossians 1. Paul says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you, made you right, by Christ's physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. We were separated from God. There should be a veil. The veil is legit. 
Our sin is a problem. And we're not worthy of connecting with God. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. Our sin should separate us from God. But Jesus paid our death penalty on the cross. Before Jesus, like Hebrews said, day after day, the priests were offering sacrifices of animals because animals were paying our death penalty as training wheels so we could understand that another had to pay the death penalty for us. And then once and for all, on the cross, Jesus paid our death penalty to make us right with God so that there's, there's no more guilt. We're free from guilt, Paul says, free from accusation holy in his sight, without blemish. That's us in the presence of God now because of Jesus. And then finally, in Hebrews 10, he goes on to say this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. So there's a new curtain, and it's Jesus. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. So did you catch that? We have confidence to enter the most holy place through Jesus. That was bonkers to say that back then. Like you didn't enter the most holy place. Nobody reading this had ever entered the most holy place. And even when the high priest did, he did it with a rope tied around him in case he died. That's not exactly a move of confidence. And yet this author tells us that through Jesus, we, you and I, can enter the very presence of God and we can do so with confidence. With the resurrection, God declared that the powers that want to keep you separated from him were defeated. Guilt is defeated. Fear is defeated. Shame is defeated. Even death is defeated. God is on the loose. Friendship with Jesus wins. And the training wheels are off forever.